But let's start on a bright note. Let's see what our oceans should look like. Let's meet David Fleetham, world-renowned underwater photographer. He began diving in 1976 in Canada and has been living in Hawaii since 1986. He's been a dive instructor, a boat captain, and he's grown gills. In 1991, that picture you see there of the sandbar shark appeared on the cover of Life magazine, and it's the only underwater image ever to be on the cover of Life magazine. He's won a lot of awards and been featured in National Geographic and worked with them on a number of assignments. And his photographs have graced the cover of over 200 magazines. Tonight, David's gonna talk about something he loves. Hawaii's reefs and marine life, and explain why we all should put on a mask and go meet these animals face to fin for the first time. Ladies and gentlemen, David Fleetham. And just while we uh, get my presentation up here, uh, I. I think we should give Greg and Pacific Whale Foundation a, a big round of applause for all the events that they put on and everything they do for our state. And so I, the presentation I'm going to give tonight assumes that everyone in the room was uh, just beamed down here from Scotty and that you know nothing about Hawaii and I'm sure that's that's not the case for the majority of you that are uh, that are here tonight but uh, but that's that's what it assumes and so we now find ourselves in the middle of the largest ocean on our planet and uh, we are almost dead center in it the most isolated group of islands in the world. And this isolation has really made a unique environment here for us. It's not that old as geology goes, a few million years old, and as you go further to the northwest, the islands become older and older. But as you go down towards Oahu and Maui, and finally the Big Island. The, uh, the Big Island is the, the youngest of all the islands, and it's, uh, and it's getting bigger all the time. If you have never seen lava flow into the ocean, it's spectacular. I highly recommend it. There's nothing like molten rock right in front of you. It's, uh, it, it should be what you see when you look up unbelievable in the dictionary. And this volcanic formation has formed amazing reefs here around the islands. There's, uh, there's a huge amount of hard coral, mostly hard coral. Some people jump in the water here and they go, really? Is that it? And they're used to big, colorful fans. And, uh, and not far from us in Indonesia, uh, you find reefs with incredible density of marine life. And, incredibly colorful, really the, the most marine life in the world is in this area, kind of just to the, uh, to the west of New Guinea. And they've got over 3,000 species of fish that they have counted up there. And as you, as you move towards Hawaii, actually, as you move in every direction away from that area, the number of species drops. And they, they counted fish a long time ago, and, uh, and they continue to update those counts. But as you move closer and closer to Hawaii, that number of fish drops. And years ago, when they first figured, well, how do fish get from A to B? How do they, how do they move around? The obvious answer was they swim, right? Fish swim, that's how they would get from, from A to B. But it's a long way to swim to get to Hawaii. And so as you move closer and closer, the Marshall Islands is down to uh, just 1,000 species. And finally, when you get to Hawaii, and, 
and this number is an estimate because it, it seems to change every year, but there's around 680 species of, of fish in Hawaii. But it's 1,000 miles to the next piece of land. And so the theory of, of fish basically hopscotching their way over to Hawaii really sort of fell apart. Butterfly fish don't swim a, a thousand miles, and so they started looking at, at other ideas for how fish move around. And they looked at how fish reproduce. That, uh, this is a sergeant major. The purple mass under it are all its eggs. And so fish lay eggs in various places. This fish is a male that holds them in its mouth. Uh, millet seed butterfly fish, these guys disperse their eggs at dusk in, uh, in the water column. And so these eggs hatch. This is the larval state of a, uh, of a creature that will eventually find its way to the reef. And when it gets there, it'll be through currents and waves and who knows what distance it will travel in that larval state. But when it finally hits the reef, that will turn into a, a moray eel. And so that, they determined, was really how fish spanned a great distance. This is the larval stage of a uh, flounder, both of these. And so these guys float in open ocean. So most of them you find are translucent, so they can avoid being eaten. But it'll land on the reef and turn into a uh, peacock flounder. And the same is true. This is an invertebrate. When it lands on the reef, it turns into a mantis shrimp. This is a, a larval stage of an octopus. It would fit on 25 cents without going over the edge. And when it settles down on the reef, that's what you end up with is uh, an adult octopus. And so they started studying currents. And I suspect we're going to hear quite a bit more about currents tonight. But uh, they started looking at how the currents move around the Pacific. And it turns out that above the equator in the, the northern hemisphere, and this is much simplified, but basically the currents circle around Hawaii in a, uh, in a clockwise direction, and they, they really don't, there's not a direct current that flows directly to Hawaii. But this is the current that moves creatures and species around the biggest planet, or the biggest ocean on the planet. So those yellow lines, occasionally from the north we get like every decade or perhaps even every hundred years, a current that comes down from above, and that's how they suspect fish found their way to Hawaii. We do not have clownfish here, and that's because the larval stage only lasts about a week. So that's within a week, once those eggs hatch, they have to find a reef. These guys, on the other hand, are plentiful in Hawaii, and their larval stage lasts for several months. And so that's how these guys can stay in open ocean to finally get a current that makes its way to Hawaii. The other thing that has occurred in Hawaii is fish have developed over millions and millions of years here to be unique species that are found only in Hawaii. This is a uh, banded angelfish, the largest of uh, the angelfish that are in Hawaii. And all, actually all but one angelfish is endemic. So there's a, another one more common than the bandit. This one is uh, it's maybe just two or three inches long, a potter's angelfish. And on almost any reef, you can swim out and find these in Hawaii, but nowhere else in the world. One of the most common wrasse on the reef in Hawaii, the saddle wrasse, is again endemic, only, only found here. And so about 20 to 25 percent of the fish that are in Hawaii are unique to Hawaii. This guy's related to a lionfish. There's two species of lionfish in Hawaii. They're both endemic. This is the other one. More difficult to find on the reef. Really obvious with the red, bright red eye. But uh, both of those have toxic spines that uh, you want to be aware of if you run into them. There's several species of goatfish in Hawaii, but this one, uh, again, somehow developed into its own unique species. The arrow's pointing to a, a little white patch is always there. They actually can range quite a bit in color, 
but that's why they're called a, a white saddle 